Um, everyone, it's my pleasure to have Francesca talk to us today. She's another Southern California girl, um, but now a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. Uh, very impressive. And so, Francesca, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. All right. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, let me just share my screen real quick. I have a slide deck uh, prepared. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, and I guess before I get started, I just want to say thanks again to all of the folk at One Quantum for putting this great event together. Um, special thanks to Denise for inviting me to talk and thanks to all of you for uh, joining me today. So my talk is uh, titled The Quantum Road Not Taken. Um, for some of you, this might seem like a strange title, but hopefully for others, um, it rings a bell to the potentially familiar poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. So for those of you who have not read this poem, um, the basic idea is uh, Robert Frost is in the woods and he approaches a fork in the road. Um, he has to decide between which of the two roads to take and in his final stanza, he says, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Now, at a sort of cursory glance at the poem, um, you might sort of think, OK, this is telling me to be a trailblazer, set my own path, uh, be different from others. However, um, several literary scholars um, have analyzed the, the poem and the way it was written and the historical context, and all have kind of concluded that Robert Frost was actually being a bit satirical here. Um, sort of in, indicating uh, the fact that if you have to make a decision between two paths, even if you actually end up taking the path that is better in the long term, you'll always have some regrets for the path you didn't take. Um, kind of leaning itself to the notion the grass is always greener on the other side. Now, that was a lot of poetry, and you might be wondering, what does any of this have to do with quantum? Well, I personally find this poem to be sort of a, a great metaphor for my own journey and experience in quantum. Um, and to kind of convey that idea, if you're in a classical world, right, you approach a fork in the road, you have to make a decision and choose one road. Thankfully for us, though, being in a quantum world, we can leverage our nice uh, property of superposition um, and simultaneously explore both of these paths so long as we can avoid measurement, which will cause us to collapse to a classical road state. Um, and I think this is a pretty good analogy for my own journey into quantum um, and experience throughout it. I've always been a really indecisive person who gets very easily excited about pretty much everything STEM. And so quantum computing provided a really unique opportunity to specialize in a super cool field developing cutting edge technology while also still getting to explore electrical engineering, computer science, mathematics, and physics, all of these diverse fields that I had an interest in. Um, and some other things you'll also notice throughout my talk today is even though I ended up taking this sort of STEM career path, I've always tried to incorporate my other interests like art and soccer um, and education and outreach um, in the work that I do. Um, so with that, time's a bit limited and I'll get started with my talk. Um, I realize that time is precious. So for those of you who can't stick around for the full 15 minutes, here's kind of a summary of what I'll be talking about today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Francisco Vasconcelos. Uh, I often go by Fran and I'm a Portuguese American who was born in Boston, but raised in sunny San Diego. Um, I attended MIT for undergrad, where I uh, graduated as part of the class of 2020 with a double major in uh, electrical engineering, computer science, and in physics. Um, I did a variety of research experiences uh, throughout undergrad, starting off in broad EECS domains, um, and in my final few years, sort of narrowing it down to quantum computing research. I'm currently uh, the academic director and one of the lead instructors for the Qubit by Qubit Global Quantum Education Initiative. Um, and I'm also pursuing some master's degrees here at the University of Oxford through the Rhodes Scholarship. Following my time in Oxford, um, I will be uh, attending UC Berkeley where I will be pursuing a PhD under professors Umesh Bazrani and Michael Jordan in quantum machine learning. Um, and I think that's probably why I was uh, scheduled to talk today with this broader theme of quantum machine learning. Now, before I 
get into sort of the weeds of my talk, uh, I just wanted to take a step back and sort of recognize the fact that um, I've been super lucky to have born, been born with two extremely loving and supportive parents who um, not only, I guess, support me personally, but also are two of my greatest academic role models and mentors. They both immigrated from Portugal to pursue graduate studies in the United States um, and ended up staying to do sort of academic uh, research in the fields of electrical engineering, computer vision. Um, and so I've just been super lucky to have them uh, supporting me this whole way. Um, and so with that, uh, my talk will be divided into sort of three key chapters, um, starting off with my undergraduate at MIT, where I really uh, got immersed into the world of quantum computing. Um, we're kind of skipping over my high school years, which is where I really sort of fell in love with STEM when I discovered uh, how or when I learned how to program in my uh, 10th grade AP computer science class and really uh, dove into research through science fair and things like that. Um, but coming into MIT, I kind of had a somewhat narrow exposure to STEM, really uh, focused on how much I loved programming and computer science. And I was pretty convinced when I got to MIT that I would end up doing pure classical machine learning research. Um, so I primarily took EECS classes and explored research in those domains, um, doing undergraduate research at uh, MIT CSAIL through the Net MIT group, which uh, builds uh, sort of Wi-Fi systems to see through walls. I also did a research experience in the MIT Media Lab uh, with the Camera Culture Group working on computational imaging stuff. Um, one of the highlights, though, was definitely my uh, internship that I did after my freshman year, where I got to work on some communications for the Deep Space Network at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, and sort of going back to what I was saying earlier about incorporating uh, some of my hobbies with my work, um, I had a lot of fun representing the uh, representing JPL by playing for the beach soccer team at the annual Aerospace Summer Games, where we beat SpaceX in the finals, which was definitely a highlight of the summer. Now, that being said, uh, my first two years at MIT, I was really reinforcing this notion that uh, I was interested in EECS and it was something I wanted to pursue long term. However, I'm super thankful that MIT um, as an institution requires that all students have to take classical mechanics and electromagnetism um, in order to graduate, because if it hadn't been for those classes, I probably never would have discovered my passion for physics. Um, I had a really amazing professor, uh, Christoph Paus, for both of these classes who would just do the really simple things like when he was explaining potential energy diagrams, he would take a five minute tangent um, to explain quantum tunneling. And this not only grew my interest in more advanced physics topics like quantum mechanics, but it also made them seem extremely approachable by um, relating them to uh, material that I was uh, understanding and covering in my classes. So he really gave me, I think, the confidence to add physics as a double major. Um, that being said, during my freshman year, I'm also really glad I kind of, for fun, signed up for an introduction to quantum computing class, which was being offered during the winter term period by the first time ever uh, by an undergraduate at the time, Amir Karamlu. And while I definitely didn't come out of the class fully understanding what quantum computing was, um, the class got me really interested in the field. Um, and Amir actually became sort of one of my first mentors in the field. In fact, he was the one that recommended to me when I told him that I wanted to do research in quantum computing. While I did work on a lot of really cool projects, I think if you ask any uh, student of the group what my greatest contribution was, it was most definitely the introduction of uh, personalized party parrots to our group Slack. So now every group member has their own little custom emoji, which is a lot of fun. Um, jokes aside, I got to work on a few really cool research projects throughout my time at Equus. And I guess if there's some sort of umbrella or overarching theme that connects all of these projects, my main focus was really on using machine learning and classical computer science to improve superconducting quantum devices, as well as our ability to assess them. Um, I was super lucky to get to work with a number of really great undergrad, grad students, and postdocs. 
So for the sake of time, I won't go into a ton of depth on these projects, but I want to quickly give some high level overviews. So my first project in the group was on extending quantum state tomography, uh, basically improving the group's ability to uh, assess the quantum states that we were creating within our quantum computer, given that they'll collapse to classical bit states upon measurement. Um, I did this project through the MIT Super Europe program and had the opportunity to present it at the MTL annual research conference, which was a lot of fun because I got to go skiing. Um, I also, my second, I guess, main project in the group was on waveguide quantum electrodynamics. Um, it helped eliminate a few computational bottlenecks in the data analysis, which uh, really made the analysis possible. Um, and this work was published last year uh, in Science Advances. Now, my final main project in the group was uh, joining this large project of uh, a study of the impact of ionizing ra radiation on superconducting quantum devices. And here I really got to work on a bunch of cool aspects of the project, uh, including data collection, developing data visualizations that enabled us to rule out different physical theories, um, developing a the analysis code framework and helping make figures for the paper that was uh, also published uh, last year um, in Nature. I think John Preskill did a pretty good job of summarizing the key takeaways of the paper. Essentially, we showed that if you wanna reach fault tolerance with a superconducting quantum device, um, you're gonna have to make it more resistant to the effects of radiation. Um, now, I also got to explore quantum computing beyond um, MIT uh, in the summer, essentially after my first year in Equus, so summer 2019, I got to attend a really cool summer school um, at the U Waterloo IQC called USEQUIP, um, where I met a bunch of really great people, including Caitlin, who actually just spoke. Um, following the two weeks there, I would highly recommend this program also to any undergrad looking to get into the field. Um, but following that, I went to do uh, an engine, a software engineering internship at Rigetti Computing, where I got to do some really fun work on using machine learning to improve algorithmic fidelity of uh, noisy superconducting quantum devices. And my supervisor there um, for that project, Marcus, he ended up uh, moving over to Microsoft Research Quantum um, and very kindly brought me along with him. So this past summer uh, during the pandemic, I got to do a really fun virtual internship working under Marcus on machine learning for error assessment of quantum devices. Um, and that really, I think, gives the full landscape of my research and experiences in the field thus far. Um, so the next kind of key thing I wanna move on to is my work in quantum education. I, MIT, I really got started in the realm of quantum education when Amir, who taught that class I took freshman year, asked me to join the teaching staff for the class uh, when he was teaching it again in 2019 and 2020. Um, this was super fun and I really got to hone my skills by lecturing on quantum algorithms like Grover's and Chores. I also had a lot of fun rebranding the class and making uh, dorky t-shirts that said things like Quantum Supreme on them. Um, I also started giving introductory hour-long quantum computing workshops to undergrads throughout MIT via the MIT Society of Women Engineers, which were a lot of fun. Um, one kind of interesting thing that I did was when I uh, really was starting off in the field, I wanted to learn more about the state of the technology and more general implications. So I kind of finessed interviews with four um, pretty renowned uh, quantum computing faculty at MIT, professors Aram Harrow, Dirk England, Isaac Chuang, and William Oliver, um, under the, the pretext of writing an article for the MIT Undergrad Research Journal. Um, this series of interviews I did, I wrote it up, and it was published in Merge, but is also generally accessible via the archive, a more extended version, and it's a very sort of friendly introductory read um, for anyone trying to get into the field. Now, I think um, one unexpected consequence of this was, uh, I guess, bigger names than I thought also ended up reading this paper. And John Preskill, uh, once again, very active on quantum Twitter, uh, posted a quote in which Harrow actually cited him as one of his inspirations for getting into the field. Um, this was liked by Peter Shore, so definitely my peak on quantum Twitter. 
Um, so kind of continuing uh, quantum education beyond the scope of MIT, um, I had been volunteering for an introductory Python curriculum with the coding school nonprofit, um, which was a global leader in virtual tech education. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet up with the executive director, Kira Peltz, while I was interning at Rigetti. And I pitched to her this idea of teaching a high school level introductory quantum computing course for a variety of reasons. Uh, but long story short, Kira gave me her blessing and full support to start making a curriculum. So fast forwarding two years later, um, I'm now one of the academic directors of the Coding School's Qubit by Qubit initiative. Um, we have a really cool, fancy website that I encourage you all to check out. And given that this is a woman in Quantum Summit, I wanted to highlight our very uh, female dominated leadership team. Um, we also have a really awesome board of advisors with many faces that might be familiar to all of you. We've been getting some press recently for some of our bigger initiatives, um, uh, including our year long academic course, which I'll talk about in sort of uh, on the next slide, actually. So to give you a sense of the full range of projects being done by Keep It by Keep It, I'll go through them really quick right now. Um, we're primarily sponsored by IBM Quantum and Google AI, but always looking for more sponsors if anyone wants to help make quantum education um, generally accessible. Um, so as I hinted at before, we are currently in the second semester of a first of its kind virtual year long intro to quantum computing course, which is being offered to over 8000 students worldwide. Um, some fun facts are that over 55% of our students come from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds, and we've had an extremely high retention rate, which is really awesome considering how difficult and long the course has been. Uh, next week, we'll be giving a March meeting talk on our findings in quantum education. Um, last weekend, we actually held a really big diversity in quantum computing conference, which was very well attended. Um, and I had a lot of fun moderating a panel on educational opportunities and the policy landscape in quantum education. Um, this summer, we'll be running a number of fun uh, quantum computing summer camps for middle and high school students. And we also recently received a unitary fund grant to run quantum computing 101 workshops in middle and high schools around the nation. So if you are interested in quantum education um, and want to get involved, we're always looking for more volunteers uh, and employees. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to conclude um, with where I am now and where I hope to be in the future. So uh, during my senior fall at MIT, I received the Rhodes Scholarship, which is a really awesome opportunity to get two years of funding to study at the University of Oxford. Um, one kind of really fun thing that I wanted to highlight was the fact that I was actually one of three uh, students in the MIT Engineering Quantum Systems Group to get a Rhodes Scholarship that year. Um, which I think just indicates to a greater societal interest in uh, quantum computing and the belief that it will be having an impact on the world in uh, coming years. So currently at Oxford, I'm pursuing a master's in statistical sciences to better prepare myself for the type of uh, theoretical work I would like to do in my PhD. Um, my dissertation will be in the Ox CSML group working under Professor Yi Waite on uh, classical neural net theory. Um, so exploring the neural tangent kernel since um, kernels have actually been one of the up and coming trends, I think in uh, quantum machine learning. Francesca, we need to wrap up. Oh, okay. So next year I'll be doing a master's in philosophy of physics. Um, I eventually will be doing a PhD at UC Berkeley working on quantum machine learning